for me because uh, my search is over and we have made a decision and we'll have an offer out shortly which we expect to be accepted. Um, and, uh, and so for all of you who are not graduating, you will have a new faculty member in history. And um, uh, and then on Thursday this week, I'm doing an event for the Center for Community Engagement um, in, uh, on the Ukraine crisis. And I'm doing it with a colleague of mine and associate Zeke Baker, who actually grew up in Ukraine, uh, lived there for 10 years. Um, and so I, I know Ukraine as a scholar. He knows Ukraine kind of, you know, because where he went to high school. Um, and uh, so tune in for that. That's You can find the link just by going to the Center for Community Engagement site on the university website. Is that going to be recorded? Uh, probably. They usually record those. What time? Thursday. Thursday at noon. What is it called? Something on Ukraine. I mean, just look yeah, for Ukraine. Like why, why, what's happening in Ukraine and why is it important? Or something like that. Um, and I encourage them to set it up as a webinar which means that it can't be zoomed on, um, but yes. they didn't. Apparently, webinars are expensive. Um, Zoom actually charges the university quite a bit for webinars. Mm. And, uh, and so it's not, which uh, kind of I'm fearful that this will get zoomed on by Russian patriots, uh, so to speak. Um, and then the, the other thing um, that we have on our plates, our collective plates, although it's really more on your plate. It's really not at all on my plate. So <laughs> just empathizing with you. Uh, is you have an essay to write. Right? And you've had the prompt accessible to you now for five days. So what do you think? Short prompt? Yeah. Uh, you said that on your website we can find a guideline. Help. Yeah, so it's not on my, I don't have a website now. No. Oh, uh, okay. So, I, but I will circulate that. <laughs> this to the guy. Entire I was looking all over this for guy. <laughs> Steve's style guide, I call him. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, if after I got tenure, I thought it'd be fun to write a style guide, and I was I intended to write an entire book. <laughs> I truly, I was going to write a, a book, uh, you know, based on teaching writing to students. And I, and I got to about 16 pages and said, ah, this is boring. <laughs> and so it's just now it exists as a, as a document. Um, and I, I share it with, with students. And it is based on problems I see in saw and student writing. That's another story. Other questions? So let me let me restate the question here um, and, and see if we can collectively brainstorm a little. So the, the top requires you to think a little bit about how nationalism has changed. Um, you know, over the, the 50 years, roughly, that the, the first cut half of this course has, has devoted itself. You know, so you think where we started, you know, we started with Twain visiting the Austro-Hungarian parliament where they are caning each other. Um, and we're ending it with this way to the gas. So any, any big thoughts on how nationalism has changed? I think at least at this point, yeah, I think at this point it's sort of escalated. You know, once you get to, I think, 1936 to 1945, like nationalism sort of comes to its extreme, its very, very sort of extreme violent conclusion yeah. of just genocide and ethnic cleansing in particular. And weirdly enough, I guess, um, at least with uh, the one book about the, the weird border state, or the, you know, that border state, I guess, um, you see a lot of other, you see a lot of like larger powers in particular sort of playing the people almost. Like with the um, border Ukrainians, like they were, you know, occupied by the Soviets, and then eventually the Germans sort of go in with these new people's, you know, national identities and sort of exploits them. Yeah. yeah. Other ideas. Yeah. 
taken away, it kind of like paved the road or gave birth to fascism. Because like you have all these countries, you know, nations that are breaking away from empires, and I feel like through that birth this idea of of Nazism and you know a, a supreme race. And you know, granted that idea wasn't solely out of, um, you know, I don't think they came up with it on their own. They definitely like took some tips from, you know, how can we how can we oppress people or whatnot. But I think it was a um, the, the environment was right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, I think Alex is correct that we we have this ideology that at the end of the 19th century is essentially a a tool. Um, that um, uh, imperial subjects use for the sake of national liberation, right? And so nationalism is progressive in orientation. Uh, and then something happens, right? Nationalism for reasons that have to do with the post-World War I settlement um, with the, imper the imperfect maps that are drawn, nationalism becomes at its extreme form exterminationist. Uh, you know, and I think when I introduce nationalism, right, the doctrine that every nation should have its own state, I, I said there has been no more powerful political ideology in the world over the last 200 years. And it is that and so it exists both in progressive forms. We would see that at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and, and this sort of fascistic um, extermination form. And you know, the, the question asks you to describe how nationalism is changed. But, but I hope too that we'll grapple with the why. Why did, why did it end? Yeah, it said two pages. I mean, is that strict? Can we go all over? Yeah, so is that what it says on the thing? So. Yeah, so that's incorrect. I actually want you to write five pages. Um, and I will I will correct that. So, well, I'll, but I'll, I'll just correct it out. The, the essay guidelines say five to seven. Five right. to okay. seven, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking five. It's just I've been kind of playing with requirements. I didn't catch that. Um, yeah. If, if I have you write four essays over the course of the I usually be looking for two or three pages. Two essays, I, I, I want five. So, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll correct that later today. But there's no telling you somewhere five to seven. Okay, so this is uh, in our kind of semester of demographic trauma. This is the week where we, we get to the crux of it. Uh, I'm going to spend today talking about the Second World War. And then Wednesday talking about Holocaust. Um, and everything is Eastern Europe specific, right? So the, the way I present the Holocaust in this course is not the same as how I present it in the Holocaust lecture series. Or someone, anybody in that course this semester? Nobody. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, so that's kind of Holocaust in Togo. This is Eastern Europe Holocaust. Um, and then next week, when you're when you're really devoted to to writing this paper, on, on Monday we'll take a breather and um, watch it. Okay, so uh, let's start with, with a little review. So if I ask you to characterize the main political and economic processes of the interwar period in Eastern Europe, what would they be? JD? The economy's crashing and the bank's freezing up. Okay, yeah, so the economy is crashing, the banks are freaking out. And what does this do to that idea of laissez-faire capitalism that has been ascendant in Europe really since the middle of the 19th century? Not working. 
What's that? Throws it out the window. Yeah, throws it out the window. You know there's a verb for that. Defenestration. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it goes kaput. <laughs> right, so, so laissez-faire, the idea of laissez-faire capitalism goes kaput. And laissez-faire capitalism, uh, the, its demise is followed by the rise of these strong interventionist authoritarian states. What are the other characteristics of the interwar period? Yeah, um, a lot of food shortages, because uh, overproduction, and then there's not like, they're not the ability to uh, harvest crops. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, start but there was starvation. Other characters. So, what were the dreams of the nationalists in the late 19th century, early 20th century? What, what sorts of states did they aspire to create? Yeah, Justin. Hey, actually, I don't want to say ethnically, but sort of the idea that like this is a perfect state with these perfect people, I guess. And sort of generally what you find, at least with the um, nationalist nations, is that they usually go with the rhetoric of this nation would be perfect if blank wasn't here. Yeah, okay, so, you know, the dream is of a nationally pure state, right? Was that the reality in, in post-World War I Europe? No. 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 Right, the maps were not perfect. So we have a lot of national conflict. And then did, did the nationalists of the late 19th century, I mean, did they dream of creating fascism? No. 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 What did they want to create? Republics. Republics, yeah, democratic republics, <coughs> parliamentary systems, right? I mean, Thomas Masaryk, you know, our great Czech nationalist whom we read a few weeks ago, he describes Czechoslovakia as the Switzerland of Eastern Europe. Right, how ideal, a land of chocolatiers, dairy farmers, and bankers. Best place in the world to live. And so I think these were the, the main characteristics of the interwar period. So we have the elimination of parliamentary systems. We have the rise of nationalist authoritarian regimes. We have the collapse of the laissez-faire capitalist state. And we have national conflict. And all of these processes paved the way for right-wing success and Nazi victory in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And these events culminated in the Second World War, when the region was either, when the region, Eastern Europe, was either occupied by Hitler or fell under the rule Hitler's fascist allies. And I, so I think we can understand the interwar period in Toto as the first battle of the Second World War. And it was won by Hitler. The second battle of the Second World War was the unsuccessful appeasement policy of France and Britain. And Hitler won the second battle in 1938 and 1939 by peacefully defeating two Central European countries of major importance. Okay, so first of all, on March 14, 1938, Hitler marched into Austria, and he was welcomed as a savior. Of course, we Americans, we, we know of these events from that greatest movie of all time, The Sound of Music. <laughs> uh, Christopher, very young, Christopher Plummer. Uh, Hitler then held a referendum to legitimate the so-called Anschluss, 99.75% of the population of Austria voted in favor of annexation. Uh, 
presumably the one quarter of one percent that voted against was the Von Trapp family. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everybody's seen Sound of Music, right? Yeah. No. Uh, really? Kevin's seen Sound of Music. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's such a beautiful film. Young Julie Andrews, young Christopher Plummer, some girl who a sister who looks like Natalie Wood. Yeah, Wasn't the referendum taken after the German troops were already there and yes. staring at everybody while they were voting? Yes. Are you suggesting that that might be an unfair? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, okay. So uh, early 1938, Germany and Austria uh, merged, and then on October of 1938, the Wehrmacht entered the Sudetenland the southern territories. And this is the German inhabited part of northwest Czechoslovakia. And you can kind of see where these are. So basically all these territories in pink here are part of Czechoslovakia, but they're German speaking, right? So these are, you cross the border from Germany into Bohemia, the eastern, the westernmost part of Czechoslovakia, and you're still in German speaking. Territory. And these territories, the Sudetenlands, had been sacrificed to Hitler by the Western powers, by Britain and France, to satisfy Hitler's craving for the unity of the German speaking people. Right? I mean, it, it, it basically resolves the problem. It fixes the fact that not all German people, German-speaking people, live in one state. And again, this was authorized by the British and the French. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, famously traveled to Munich. He met with Hitler. He said, okay, we will not object if you annex these territories. He went back to Paris to meet with his French counterpart, and he famously said, peace in our time. That war has been averted. And of course, the lesson of Munich in 1938, which we're seeing oft repeated now in the press, press coverage of Vladimir Putin, is you can't appease tyrants. Well, whatever the case, the occupation of the Sudetenlands provoked a similar move by Poland, which occupied the area around Teschen. And this is the, this area right here. Um, and this was also part of Czechoslovakia. Um, and it was gobbled up by Poland. Um, and Hungary even seized some territories in Czechoslovakia, territories that it had lost. <coughs> to Czechoslovakia at the end of the First World War. So this is kind of interesting. We, these countries that we are prone to see as victims of Nazism are acting very much like Nazis, right? It's kind of land to grab in 1938. But whatever the case, the future of an independent Czechoslovakia was, was short-lived. On March 15, 1939, the German, uh, German army occupied the rest of the country um, after gaining the support of the indigenous Slovakian nationalist movement. And then the Nazi war machine continued to move. On March 23, 1939, it occupied part of Lithuania, and it demanded that Poland turned over what was called the Danzig Corridor. And I think I can show that on the following map. Let's see here. Well, not quite. So this is, oh yeah, I can. So this is the, the city of Danzig right here. It was a German-speaking city. And Hitler wanted essentially a land bridge here connecting Danzig with Eastern Prussia and um, this would be Pommern here, this territory of, of, of Germany. And so Hitler was demanding as a uh, reason to avoid war with Poland, uh, the annexation of this territory right here, make the German state contiguous, okay? 
And so Danzig is German speaking, but it's in principle free. And then this is Eastern Prussia, right, which is part of the German state. So they want their only port? What's that? <laughs> it looks like the only port. Yes, yes, yes. They want the only Polish port. Yeah. Just, just tangentially, what, why does Russia control the territory around um, Koningsberg now? Okay, so this right here, Eastern Prussia, is now uh, the Russian oblast, and oblast is like a county in, in Russia, uh, of Kaliningrad is what it's called. And it's because this was a war trophy. Um, so Russia sees, Soviet Union sees this at the end of the Second World War. So Eastern Prussia, the old German city of Königsberg, um, Königsberg would translate as the King's City, um, that, is, um, that is now part of, of Russia. And it's the only non-contiguous part of Russia. You have to pass through uh, Belarus and Lithuania um, in order to, to get there. OK, so, so Hitler also won an important diplomatic victory. And he took advantage, let me go back a slide. Hitler took advantage of the lack of consensus between Western powers in the Soviet Union about how to combat fascism to offer the Soviet Union a non-aggression pact. And essentially, what happened is, is the Soviet Union looked, Stalin looked at Munich, at the policy of appeasement, where the Western allies had authorized the annexation of the Sudetenland. Stalin looked at that, and he thought, <coughs> The Western capitalist democracies will never stand up to fascism. And so I, Joseph Stalin, need to buy the Soviet Union some time. Hmm. And so according to the terms of this agreement, which is called the Hitler-Stalin Pact, or sometimes it's named for the foreign ministers, Molotov and Ribbentrop. According to the terms of this pact, there were going to be 15 years of non-aggression between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. In fact, Hitler or Stalin, who was a, a famous postmaster, there's a word in Georgia. You know, Stalin was Georgian. There's a word in Georgian for postmaster, Tamada. But Stalin, on the signing of this agreement, he uh, he said, I hear the German people love its Fuhrer, loves its Fuhrer. I would like to drink to his health. And so Stalin drank to Hitler's health. And according to the terms of this treaty, Eastern Europe was divided into German and Russian spheres of influence. So Stalin got the eastern part of Poland, the entire Baltic region, Finland, and the territory called Bessarabia. And this is Bessarabia right here. It's the present day state of Moldova. Um, that word in Russian, Bessarabia, means land without arrows. And it refers to the fact that this was once part of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. What was the first place you said that he got control of? So he got the eastern part of Poland, he got the entire Baltic region. So these are the Baltic republics right here, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, he got Finland, you see Finland up there at the top. Uh, and he got Bessarabia. Hitler got the western part of Poland. Now, the Hitler-Stalin Pact also set forth in exacting detail the circumstances under which the Second World War began. So a week after the pact was signed, on September 1st, 1939, at 4.45 in the morning, 
the German Wehrmacht attacked Poland with 1,500 airplanes, nine tank divisions, and 49 motorized infantry divisions. And just so you know, a, a division is usually in the vicinity of 10,000 men. The Poles defended themselves with a single tank division and 12 cavalry divisions. And I'm not joking here. They defended themselves against German blitzkrieg with cavalry. In October, Hitler declared that Poland was a protectorate of the Reich. So this is what we now recognize as the beginning of the Second World War. Right? The German occupation of the western half of Poland. And it was set forth in the terms of the Stalin-Hitler Treaty. So this is exactly what the treaty allowed. 16 days later, on September 17, 1939, Stalin cashed in on his check. The Soviet Union occupied the eastern half of Poland. And in mid-June 1940, the Baltic region, Bessarabia, in northern Bukovina. And this is northern Bukovina right here. Um, it's historically a Romanian. And uh, again, this is what was envisioned by treaty. So, so in other words, the circumstances under which the Second World War began were all discussed by the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany in the weeks preceding the war. And the Nazi attack against Poland met with a firm Western response. On September 3rd, 1939, Britain and France declared a war on Germany. Uh, this war engulfed Western Europe, but Hitler's triumphant advance in the East continued, really without any opposition. September what? Uh, September 3rd. <clears throat> okay, so among other things, you've learned the day the Second World War begins, right? September 1st, 1939. Okay, so let's go forward a slide. So in Romania and in Hungary, the extreme right gained further ground. And in Romania, a man named Ian Antonescu came to power. And he was the leader of a political party called the Iron Guard. And this was an indigenous fascist movement. Um, once he was in power, Antonescu invited German troops to occupy Romania. Anybody collect stamps in here when they were kids? I inherited like binders and binders with my grandfather's stamps. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so during the Second World War, there was a very famous run of American stamps that were printed. They had the flags of the countries occupied by Nazi Germany. Was Romania occupied? They're there by invitation. Is that an occupation? No. Yeah, I mean, you know, on this day, there are American troops in Germany. They're there by, by German invitation. Is that an occupation? No. Yeah, that's good. Didn't they also sell oil to the Germans as well? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Romania. So it's less like they're being forced to do anything, and it's more they're just willingly giving resources to you know, Germany. Yeah, and, and, and it's because they, they see common cause, right? I, I mean, uh, the Romanian fascist movement sees common cause with the German fascist movement. Um, in November of 1939, 
Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia officially join the Axis. So that is, they're going to fight on the side of Germany in the Second World War. Bulgaria joined a few months later. In April of 1940, German troops invaded Yugoslavia. June of 1940. But again here, Yugoslavia is the exception, right? Yugoslavia is invaded. The rest of these countries willingly join. What is it you think they, what do, what do they see in fascism? Yeah, um, wait, <clears throat> for some of them, it's a way to get back lost territories. Yeah, create that ethnically pure, that nationally pure state, right, that they had all dreamed about in the World War period. Yeah, Mackenzie? I was wondering uh, how many people you were talking about earlier in your class about like the oral questions and stuff, like the Christian group. I was wondering uh, if they basically saw like the like, Asian group as being the possession of like communism, being like the like, 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 Yeah, so. You know, partly it's a, it's a calculation, right? That communism and the Soviet Union is a bigger menace. Um, that, that certainly played a role. Um, actually, I, I, I honestly, I think that's a, a common trope on that. I can't tell you the number of times in recent years I've heard people on the right here in American politics say, you know, excuse like Donald Trump's bad behavior by blaming the left. Well, if you guys weren't all so radical, right? As if that's uh, some sort of justification. Uh, I've always thought both political parties need to get their own houses in order. Yeah, other, other ideas. Yeah, so they basically decided to join our, I'm sorry, how do you say his last name? Yeah, they basically decided to join because he has like the primary source of fuel. Like, would you would you say like that was the primary? Well, no. Well, I, I think it even goes beyond that. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, that's the German interest in Romania is sure. the, the oil fields, right? But but a lot of it is, you know, these these indigenous fascists, the Romanian fascists, the Hungarian fascists, the Bulgarian fascists, they see in fascism an express lane to modernity. Right? So, so, you know, we failed at liberal capitalism. We failed at democracy. Uh, you, you know, we, we, in some parts, we tried communism. Didn't work or was short lived. So now we're going to try fascism. Your hand goes up. I was going to say, how much did fear play into these countries willingly joining the Axis powers? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, after the fact. They said there was nothing voluntary about this. But, but the problem is, is we have a case of a country that doesn't, Yugoslavia. And well, it's not that it doesn't. But Yugoslavia is split, uh, actually. The Croatians fight on the side of the Axis. The Serbs, the Macedonians, the Bosnians do not. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, so, we, you know, the, the Nazis, as we, we all know, had a racial hierarchy, and at the top are the Teutons, right, the Anglo-Saxons, so the British and the French, uh, the British and the, the Germans. And then you kind of go down from there to Jews at the bottom, all right? Then one level above the Jews were the Slavs, the Slavic people, so the Bulgarians would, would fall into that. Um, and then you have, you know, various people in the middle, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it is strange that the Bulgarians would willingly join, you know, a, a sort of fascist alliance that kind of sees their place at the bottom. Well, we know now, uh, because of, of quite a bit of really good historical work, that as early as December of 1940, Hitler had bigger things in mind. Um, 
he began to plan for an attack on the Soviet Union. So the, you know, the 15 years of non-aggression really only worked out to be a little less than three years of non-aggression. Or excuse, two years of non-aggression. And the invasion occurred on June 21st, 1941. What is June 21st? Summer. Yes, yeah, summer is the first day, the first day of summer, right? Or the day before the first day of summer. So what does that mean for the? Solstice? Yeah, mm -hmm. so what, what's the advantage of invading on June 21st? You it's not the light outside. Yeah, and particularly this is at pretty far northern latitude, right? So you have lots of hours of light. Um, that wasn't a coincidence. And the Germans invaded with 140 divisions. So 1.4 million men. This is, it was and remains the largest land invasion in all of human history. Uh, the Baltic countries, much of the eastern part of the Soviet Union, all the way to the outskirts of Moscow, were quickly conquered. Um, I know a few of you were in my Soviet Union in World War II class, and you know the, the first two years of the Second World War were basically two years of retreat of the Soviet Red Army. And then everywhere where the Nazis came, they set up local Quisling administrations. And that, that word requires a little bit of explanation. Quisling refers to the guy whom the Germans put in charge of Norway. And, uh, and so we use it just to refer to kind of uh, indigenous collaborators. And in Serbia, the Quisling was General Milan Nedic, who formed a national salvation government. In the Czech protectorate, the Quisling was a man named Emil Hacha, a Czech fascist. But in the Baltic republics, in the Soviet Union, the manner of control was more direct. Local officials in the Baltic republics and the Soviet Union answered directly to the Reichskommissariat. So that, that is, they were actually incorporated into the German Empire. Um, so the Baltic republics, like the Sudetenland, and like Austria, were to be fully incorporated into Germany. Desirable elements of the populations of these countries would be assimilated, the Germanness. Undesirable elements, like Jews, were to be exterminated. And Lithuania had a sizable Jewish population. And then much of the extermination was assisted by anti local indigenous anti-Semitic groups, particularly in, in Lithuania. There was no shortage of anti-Semites willing to help the Germans. And so that's kind of one form of occupation, right? These territories were actually incorporated into the Reich. Right? They became part of Germany. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Croatia remained independent in principle, but only because they were ruled by collaborationist fascist groups. Uh, Slovakia and Croatia also sent troops to the Eastern Front. Slovakian and Croatian troops fought at Stalingrad. 2,500 miles east of Berlin. Slovakian and Croatian troops assisted in the Holocaust. And then Hitler's other satell satellites in the region did not introduce full-fledged fascist regimes, but they also helped with varying degrees of German aggression and racism. And I have in mind here, particularly Italy, I think it's kind of the best example of this. I, we, we have a graduate student now in history, Rosemary Trenholm, who's writing about efforts to reconstitute Italy's 
uh, Jewish community at the end of the Second World War. And Italy's Jews were contrary to virtually every other Jewish community in Europe. Italy's Jews were not Ashkenazi. They were Sephardic. So what does that mean? Yeah, Kyle? They were from, like, the Iberian Peninsula, North Africa, were driven out after the Reconquista. Yeah, so is that that's Sephardic or Ashkenazi? It's Sephardic. Okay, kind of. Yeah, Mackenzie? Well, I think Ashkenazi means more like Eastern European, right? Yeah, yeah, but many of those Jews came from uh, the Iberian Peninsula as well. Mm -hmm. so, so in the 20th century, what this divide, this is like the fundamental divide in all of Judaism. Right, the, the divide between the Sephardic communities and the Ashkenazi communities. Ashkenazi are Jews of European origin, typically Eastern Europe, where the largest Jewish populations in the world were. Sephardic Jews trace their roots to the Mediterranean basin of the Middle East. Okay, and um, uh, Italy's Jews were, for the most part, Sephardic. Uh, and as my graduate student, Rosemary, has discovered, they looked on the Holocaust as an Ashkenazi phenomenon, right? That's something that's affecting those other Jews. Not us, right, because we're different, because we're Sephardic. And um, uh, as, as a result of this, and as a result of the peculiarity of Italian fascist politics, uh, Italian Jews were rounded up very late in the game, like 19, 1943, 1944. Um, and uh, uh, only you know, comparatively small number of Italian Jews perished in the Holocaust. Um, um, and, and so, but, but again, this was only possible because Italy was a loyal ally of, of, the, of Nazi Germany in the Second World War. Right? Anything less than that sort of loyalty would have produced a situation where all Italian Jews were rounded up, regardless of their origin in the Middle East or, uh, or in Europe. And by the way, uh, this divide, uh, Ashkenazi Sephardic, this is really a central divide to understanding contemporary Israeli politics. Um, because generally speaking, the right in Israel today is Sephardic in origin. Uh, the left in Israeli politics is Ashkenazi. So in other words, liberals come, the liberal Jews in Israel come from Europe. Conservative Jews tend to come from the Middle East. And this is particularly, I think, relevant for understanding um, prospects of peace with the Arab world. The fact that Jews who come from the Arab world tend to be much more skeptical um, about the prospects for peace. And that's kind of um, uh, dispiriting. Okay. Um, so Hungary declared war against the Soviet Union and Western powers. But after Stalingrad, which was uh, November, December 1942, January 1943, when it became clear that uh, Nazi Germany was not going to win the war, right? So that, you know, Stalingrad was the turning point. Right? Uh, after Stalingrad, the Soviet Union was fighting a, kind of a war of advancement, the retreat had stopped, and like, we didn't know that the, the Allies were gonna win the war, but it was pretty clear that the Allies were not gonna lose the war. Okay, so maybe there will be some sort of negotiated settlement. And, but after Stalingrad, when it became clear that, um, that Nazi Germany was not going to win, uh, Admiral Horthy, remember that sort of Hungarian conservative, sought to consolidate Hungarian territorial gains by cooperating more fully with the final solution. And even in the summer of 1944, Hungary was exporting Jews abroad to Auschwitz. But this was not enough for Hitler. In October of 1944, Hitler removed Horthy from power and replaced him 
with a fascist. And this was all done to kind of speed up the final solution, knowing that the end of the war was close. And I think this is also like, I mean, it's mind boggling. You know, the, the kind of rabidness of the hatred, right? That they know they're gonna lose the war. And, and so it's not that they take their foot off the gas pedal for the Holocaust, they accelerate the extermination, right? Knowing that they're gonna lose. Uh, Romania joined the Hitler's alliance to rectify the territorial losses of 1938, 1939, when Romania lost Bessarabia to the Soviet Union. And so Romanian troops subsequently played major roles on the Ukrainian front of the Second World War. Um, the city of Odessa was occupied by Romanians. Odessa, the second largest Jewish city in all of Europe, 70 synagogues. The Romanians, according to uh, Odessa, stories of the war were worse than the Nazis. Uh, Sevastopol, Sevastopol, as we would say in, in Russian, the Russian naval port on, in Crimea was besieged by Romanians. Uh, and of course, everywhere the Romanians went, they participated in Holocaust. And the situation changed only at the end of the war when Soviet troops entered Romania in the summer of 1944. And the Romanian political elite engineered the arrest of Ian Antonescu, their fascist, and announced the end of the war. But even this was not enough to expiate the guilt that Romania had accrued for participating in Nazism and the Holocaust. And so Romania's neutrality lasted only a few weeks. It then tried to declare war on Nazi Germany in order to build the case that it had always been a reliable Western ally and that it had been forced to participate in fascism. Yeah, I mean, this, this is all just kind of morally despicable, right? Uh, JD. Uh, was there a change in government Yeah, in Romania? Yeah, there, there was. Uh, in fact, the, the government in Romania that, that uh, declares war on Germany is technically an autocracy. Uh, it's led, led by a guy named King Michael. But again, this is mainly important for understanding the stories that Eastern Europeans tell about themselves after the war. Right? We were occupied. We had no choice. That's all bullshit. OK. Um, so Bulgaria had joined the Axis in 1941. And Bulgaria had allowed German troops to use the country's territory in order to launch attacks on Greece, which was a Western ally. But Bulgaria had remained neutral in the war against the Soviet Union. And this was largely because there was a lot of pro-Russian sentiment in Bulgaria. Uh, you know, Bulgaria exists today because of Russia. Russia liberated Bulgaria from the Ottoman Empire in 1878. Um, uh, but, but Bulgaria, despite its neutrality, it did participate in the Holocaust, um, even though it had a, a relatively small Jewish population. But it did introduce anti-Jewish legislation in 1942 at the direction of Germany. Um, but two days after Soviet troops entered Bulgaria in September of 1944, there was a coup to remove the pro-German government, and Bulgaria declared war on Germany. And again, this is all deeply unprincipled, right? It's about extirpating guilt. Guilt for collaboration, guilt for participating in the Holocaust. And despite the general trend toward Nazi collaboration, there were, there were resistance movements in Eastern Europe. There were substantial resistance movements in Yugoslavia 
in Albania, in Greece, um, and especially in Poland. And Polish troops had fought alongside British and American troops um, in Italy, um, in North Africa, and in the Middle East. And Polish partisans, the so-called Home Army, launched guerrilla attacks against German occupiers at home. Um, in 1943, Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, Jews were, as we'll talk on, on Wednesday, Polish Jews were uh, initially segregated. They were forced into wall, essentially walled encampments within big cities before be being deported to concentration camp. In 1943, Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto rose up. One of the, the most heroic moments of Holocaust resistance. I'll, I'll talk about this in, in, in much more detail on Wednesday. Uh, the response, the, the German response to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was to simply level uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, in 1944, with the Soviet Red Army parked on the opposite side of the Vistula River, the river that flows through Warsaw, Soviet patriots rose up to liberate their city before it could be liberated by the Red Army. What's the advantage in that? They get to have their own government and not yeah. one that's established. Yeah, I mean, they can read the tea leaves, right? And they know, like, if the Red Army liberates us, we're beholden to the Soviet Union, right? And so they, you know, they rise up against Germany. And you know what the Red Army does? Ceases hostilities. It let the Poles and the Germans fight it out. Uh, and this is, I, I think, you know, if the the, um, the the Polish or the the Jewish uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 was one of the greatest moments of uh, you know Holocaust resistance. The the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 uh, and the Soviet response to it is one of the most cynical moments. Right? Let these people kill each other was essentially the Soviet. In Yugoslavia, Joseph Tito, whom I'll talk about in a couple of weeks, had nearly 400,000 soldiers in uniform at the end of the war. And it not only resisted German advances into Yugoslavia, but it ultimately liberated Yugoslavia. And so Yugoslavia is the exception in Eastern Europe. It was not liberated by the Soviet Red Army. It liberated itself. Um, and then the extreme nationalism of Eastern Europe in the interwar period in Eastern Europe fostered the fascist movements that collaborated with Hitler. And in a similar way, the region's rejection of Western economic systems particularly after the financial crisis of the late 20s and early 30s, led to Nazi exploitation of these conquered territories. For instance, the Nazis wanted the Balkans, the Balkan Peninsula, to adapt itself to its natural character. That's actually how the Germans talked about the Balkan Peninsula, to stop industrialization. So the chief role of the Balkan Peninsula in the German view of things was agricultural production, right? To export agriculture to the right. And then in Hungary, which was more industrialized, industry was brought under the complete control of Nazi administrators. The economies of Austria, of Czechoslovakia, of the Baltic republics, all highly industrialized, were also brought under direct German administration. They were just considered to be part of the German economy. And so what this meant is that lots of fortunes were made in Eastern Europe during the war. And then the allied countries of Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria were also incorporated into the German war economy. 
roughly 75% of all foreign trade was with Germany. And as the war turned badly for Germany, this trade was conducted chiefly through loans. Right? So Germany essentially paid with loans. Um, and of course, these loans were never, never repaid. Poland was plundered by the Germans, um, along with nearly 700,000 prisoners of war, that is 700,000 soldiers that were captured by Germany during that opening moment in 1939. Some two million Poles were enslaved. Right? They were sent to Germany to work in industry. And World War II mobilized nearly twice as many people and killed nearly three times as many people as the First World War. It led to severe population losses in Central and Eastern Europe. It led to um, a palpable gender imbalance that was most pronounced in the Soviet Union, where there were six women of reproductive years. You know, generally demographers consider reproductive years to be women between the ages of 15 and 45. Six women in that age bracket for every four men. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? Not enough people to fuel the economy, basically. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're a you know, 22-year-old woman, what, what are your chances of family formation? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine, you, you know, how this played out. I mean, to be a, a man in that age bracket in the Soviet Union who survived the war, right, and is not hor yeah. horribly mutilated. I, I mean, your prospects are pretty good, right? I, I mean, there are lots of women uh, available to you. To be a woman is much more difficult. Um, and, and so things like family formation become very difficult. And interestingly, there's a historian, uh, she's Japanese, but she writes in English, Mie Nakachi, um, who's written about this. And she has shown that the, the Soviet Union in the late 1940s actually encouraged women to have children out of wedlock. Oh. Um, because it simply was impossible for women to get married, right? And so it was the patriotic duty for men to sow their oats, so, so to speak, and for women to bring uh, children to term, right? Because the, the demographic losses were so uh, you know, catastrophic. And you know, that, uh, it, it took a long time for that gender imbalance to work out. You know, it took decades and decades. Um, you know, in some of these countries in Eastern Europe, the battle lines moved you know, back and forth across the country two to three times. I've seen this. I visited the, the battlefield at Borodino, which is west of Moscow. Borodino was the kind of pivotal battle in the, the Napoleonic Wars um, in 1812. Um, but Borodino also saw fighting in 1941. In 1944, right? And so it's like this field where three battles were fought. Right, and there's residue from all three battles there to be seen. Um, and so what this meant is that wealth that was accumulated over generations was destroyed. The Soviet Union suffered the heaviest burden. Roughly 27 million Soviet citizens died in the Second World War. 25 million more Soviet citizens and homeless. In contrast, 
Germany lost six million people during the Second World War. The populations of Poland and Yugoslavia were decimated. Poland lost three million lives. Yugoslavia lost 1.75 million lives. And then, of course, across the map of Eastern Europe, six million Jews simply disappeared. Right? They were there at the beginning of the war and not there at the end of the war. The German communities in Eastern Europe, this non-indigenous middle class that we, we learned about last semester in History 415, they were eliminated in different ways. As the Red Army advanced in 1944 and 1945, eight to nine million ethnic Germans fled westward um, and then according to the terms of the Yalta conference in February 1945, when uh, Hitler, not Hitler, Stalin, um, Churchill and Roosevelt met in Yalta, and then Potsdam in August 1945, where Truman, um, uh, Clement Attlee, Churchill's successor, and Stalin met uh, in the suburb of Berlin. Uh, these Ex ethnic expulsions of Germans were authorized. Like Silesia, let me go back to this map here. So you see this right here, this is Silesia. This was historically a German territory. The Allies at the end of the war authorized the ethnic cleansing of, si of Silesia. So Germans were forced out, ethnic Germans were forced out. This today would be considered genocide. Right, the, the sort of ethnic cleansing of these, these German territories. Other ethnic cleansings also occurred. Nearly two million Poles left, let's compare the maps here. So here's Poland before the war, here's Poland after the war. Well, I guess we don't have it after the war, but you can see what happens to the Soviet border here. All of these territories here, which were part of Poland before the war, become part of the Soviet Union. And they're cleansed of Poles. And so the Poles who are kicked out of, East, of former Eastern Poland, what becomes Western Ukraine, Western Belarus, Russia, they're the same Poles who settle in Silesia. Right, so there's kind of a, a, a domino effect here to the ethnic cleansing. So the Poles are ethnic cleansed from here, but they're rewarded with territory which was ethnically cleansed of Germans. Okay, and many of those Germans make their way to, to what's becoming West Germany. They become DPs, dis, displaced, displaced persons. I'll just wonder, like, how much of uh, German, ethnic German uh, Jews went westward after the war, like, how that influenced the, uh, like, Western German politics? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of former Nazis. So. Yeah, and th this is, I mean, it remains a, a big thing. I, I have a very good friend who's Berlin-based now, but grew up in Munich, and her, her parents were, um, her parents were DPs from Silesia, from Breslau, in, um, which is now the Polish city of Wroclaw. And um, she has all sorts of fascinating stories. She said that in the late 1980s, as communism was crumbling, she went with her mother to visit uh, Breslau, where her mother grew up. And her mother went and knocked on the door of the apartment building that her family had used to live in. And a woman, Polish woman, came and answered the door, didn't speak any German, but, uh, but my friend's mother could see behind her the piano Aww. that was her family's piano. Right? This is 40 years after they had been ethnically cleansed. And again, we, it, it's uncomfortable, right, to talk about Germans as ethnic Germans as being the object of ethnic cleansing, but they most certainly were um, at the end of the, the Second World War. And then obviously the, the economic losses of the Second World War were just immense. I mean, almost the entirety of Eastern Europe was in devastation. Warsaw became the most devastated history the most devastated city in, in the history of the world. I mean, just the entire city needed to be razed. Um, 
one quarter of all the buildings in Budapest were destroyed by fighting. Um, in Yugoslavia, the total costs of war destruction exceeded the size of the pre-war economy by almost four times. So in other words, much of Eastern Europe was pushed back into the 19th century by the Second World War. And as a result of this, it's common in Eastern Europe to, to see the Second World War as the greatest of all historical watersheds because it produced a break in the historical continuity. There is simply no continuity between the pre-war period and the post-war period. So, so profound was the change caused by the Second World War. And obviously, the, the figures in the, the fascist governments were tried. They were imprisoned. They were executed. The fascist dreams, greater Germany, greater Romania, all of these dreams went away. And there was a new occupier, the Soviet-led army. And so the pendulum had swung from one extreme, fascism, to another extreme, Stalinism. Uh, and that is a topic we're going to spend a couple weeks exploring. OK, any, any questions about this? OK, let's break for about 10 minutes. And then I want to talk a little bit about this memoir, which I think you finished reading last week. Um, but I think we should at least touch upon it. Okay.